everyone, and welcome back. I'm Joe Chappelle, and you're listening to episode 13 of the OBGYN podcast. First off, let me thank all of you who have shown interest in the Slack. We've had some interesting conversations about how we treat endometritis differently throughout the world. We would love to hear from all the rest of you as well, so please join in the conversation by emailing me at feedback at obgyn.fm so I can send you an invite. Today, we are taking a little break from puerperal fever to have Dr. Sarah Kim back to talk to us about delayed cord clamping. This is a rather hot topic here in the States, so I was very excited when she told me that she wanted to tackle it. So, today, I'm going to get out of the way and have her tell us all about it. So let's get started with episode 13, Delayed Cord Clamping. In January of this year, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists came out with revised recommendation regarding the timing of umbilical cord clamping after birth. Its publication has brought this topic to the forefront, and numerous pieces have been written about it, even in places like the New York Times. Because this has penetrated into consciousness of the general public, I thought it would be interesting to discuss the history and literature of cord clamping. So, let's delve into this topic a bit further. While the actual practice of obstetrics may be more of a recent phenomenon, documentation of labor and delivery of babies goes way back to the time of cave paintings. One of the first mentions of the placenta and umbilical cord was in the 5th century BCE with Hippocrates and Galen. They proposed that the importance of the placenta was to provide nutrition to the baby in utero. One of the first female gynecologists practicing in 11th century Italy further highlights fascination with the umbilical cord. Although there is no mention of when to clamp the cord, there is a detailed description of the proper way of tying it off before cutting. The ceremonial aspect of the act is no surprise, given the symbolic nature of the act. It is a literal and figurative act of separating mother and baby, and creating two separate people. Although we have no direct knowledge of when the cord was tied off for most of human history, we can infer from some ancient traditions that most cultures waited until well after the cord stopped pulsating to tie it off. That led to a much more blood being transferred to the fetus at the expense of increased maternal bleeding. This tug of war between mother and baby will be immediately recognizable to modern obstetricians. This is something that we deal with all the time, whether it is in cases of preeclampsia or PPROM. How much risk are we willing to let the mother be in for the benefit of the baby? That is essentially what we are asking when we talk about delayed cord clamping, and that is what we are going to explore more of today. The change from cord clamping after pulsation stops to immediate clamping began in the 1700s. The proto-optetricians were trying to reduce the amount of women experiencing postpartum hemorrhage because it was, and continues to be, one of the leading causes of maternal mortality. In order to combat it, the active management of the placenta was created. It entails uterine massage, cord traction, and in modern times, administration of oxytocin or other uretonics. Active management of the placenta has been shown to decrease blood loss from delivery. This is still true today, and many providers use some or all the mentioned techniques at delivery. Typically, active management requires immediate core clamping because the sooner the placenta is delivered, the less the bleeding. This caught on quickly in the 1700s, and soon it was considered primitive to wait to cut the cord. And some went so far as to say that early clamping and active management would, quote-unquote, spare the bed linen from being soiled by blood. However, not everyone agreed with this philosophy, and there were still plenty of people who advocated for the traditional method of placenta management and its ability to allow the cord to stay patent for longer. The dangers to the child, of which we'll get to soon, were known then as well, and Rasmus Darwin, writing in 1801, opined that clamping early is quote-unquote to tying and cutting the navel too soon is very injurious to the child. In any case, the advocates of immediate core clamping appear to have won out because by modern times, immediate core clamping was the norm in most places. But why? Well, it comes back to postpartum hemorrhage. So let's look at one of those studies to see how much of an effect it has on blood loss. One of the most famous studies is known as the Hinchinbrook trial, which was published by Jane et al. in 1998. They demonstrated exactly what the obstetricians from the 17 and 1800s had known, that active management of the placenta decreases blood loss. In particular, their protocol involved giving oxytocin within two minutes of birth, along with immediate cord clamping and traction of the cord to deliver the placenta. They found a 60% reduction in postpartum hemorrhage in women who had active management. 
This is a huge number, but a more important one for our purposes today will be number needed to treat with active management to prevent one clinically significant hemorrhage. However, we will want to define that. Unfortunately, we don't have that number, which is part of the reason this debate has lasted this long. Now, the Hinchinbrook study is one of many that shows the maternal benefit of active placental management. And with numbers as large as 60%, it is not surprising that immediate core clamping was recommended practice by most academies and colleges. Moving on to the fetal effects, as early as the 1940s, there were papers that suggested that immediate core clamping resulted in higher rates of neonatal anemia. However, the next 60 years did not produce much research in delayed core clamping. But starting again in the late 1990s and early 2000s, several groups began to look at it again. There are a lot of papers here, so today I'm going to focus on some meta-analyses because they have had the greatest impact on the current recommendations. So let's start by looking at the potential benefits in preterm infants. A meta-analysis performed by Rabbit Al in 2012 looked at 10 randomized control trials that examined the effect of umbilical core clamping at different times in infants born before 37 weeks gestation. While there were variations of how long each study waited before clamping the cord, delayed clamping was, generally speaking, defined as waiting at least 30 seconds prior to clamping in both vaginal and cesarean deliveries. The overall finding from the meta-analysis was that delayed cord clamping allowed more placental transfusion for preterm neonates, upwards to an increase in blood volume by 8 to 24 percent, and was associated with a decrease in intraventricular hemorrhage, need for blood transfusion low blood pressure, and necrotizing enterocolitis. As mentioned before, studies use different cutoffs and have different ways to quantitatively measure blood volume and other outcomes, which make it difficult to directly compare them. Even so, the overall consensus from the meta-analysis was that the benefits of delayed core clamping in preterm infants outweigh potential risks in the immediate postpartum period. In 2006, Mercer et al. published another study that looked at the effect of delayed cord clamping on the bronchopulmonary system. The study also looked at the rate of late-onset sepsis, which they defined as an infection with positive blood culture in infants greater than 72 hours of age. What they found was that there were no significant difference in bronchopulmonary dysplasia between immediate versus delayed clamping. Moreover, in the delayed clamping group, there was found to be no case of late-onset sepsis, whereas there were six in the immediate clamping cohort. This offers support to one of the potential benefits in delayed core clamping, which is transfer of more progenitor cells and immunoglobulins with the increase in blood volume, resulting in the development of a more robust immune system. The benefit of delayed core clamping may not only be seen in immediate postpartum, but also long-term, as demonstrated by another study by Mercer et al. in 2010. This study was, in essence, a continuation of the prior one, but followed the infants to seven months. After controlling for confounding factors, brief delay of 30 to 45 seconds with the infant held below the level of the placenta was found to have higher Bailey score, which is a way to measure development in infants. While this offers a glimpse of the potential long-term benefits of delayed core clamping in preterm infants, further research needs to be done as this study was very limited by power, as many participants were lost to follow up. The data on preterm infants has been circulating for a while, but what about term infants? A meta-analysis 2013 by McDonald et al. looked at 15 trials involving term infants and saw no significant difference in APGAR scores or neonatal intensive care unit admission. However, hemoglobin concentrations were significantly lower in the early clamping group in the immediate postpartum period. Not only that, this iron deficiency seemed to persist for up to 3 to 6 months after delivery in the early clamped groups. Based on these and other studies, there has been a growing consensus that delayed core clamping of some duration imparts significant benefits to preterm neonates and also some milder benefits for term neonates. It is these benefits that have gradually shifted the collective thought on timing of umbilical core clamping and have ultimately led to the change in recommendations. Before I get into the risks of delayed core clamping, I want to talk a little bit about cord milking. This is similar to delayed cord clamping in that the goal is to move more blood from the cord into the neonate. It involves milking or stripping the umbilical cord to quickly increase placental transfusion to the newborn and is usually performed within 10 to 15 seconds after delivery. This practice may be useful in circumstances where waiting for 30 to 60 seconds to clamp the cord is not safe or feasible. 
A randomized control study by Rab et al. in 2011 compared milking the umbilical cord four times versus delayed clamping the cord for at least 30 seconds in both vaginal and C-section deliveries. What the study found was no significant difference between the two groups, implying that milking the cord may confer similar benefits as delayed cord clamping. The same group followed this cohort of participants for up to three years to assess whether there are long-term neurodevelopmental effects between milking and delayed cord clamping. The publication 2015 suggested that due to the small number of participants, a definitive conclusion was difficult to make, but there seemed to be no adverse effects of differences between the two groups. Now that we have discussed the benefits of delayed cord clamping, let's talk about the risks. As we let more blood transfer from the placenta to the neonate, it is reasonable to be worried about both polycythemia and neonatal jaundice. However, the data on both is mixed. A randomized control study by Sago et al. in 1972 saw an increase in bilirubin levels and polycythemia when comparing immediate versus delayed clamping, and cited this as a reason to not perform delayed cord clamping. And the meta-analysis by Rab et al. that we talked about earlier found a similar increase in hyperbilirubinemia in preterm neonates that they examined, although the study was not powered for that outcome. Again, similar findings were made regarding term infants by McDonald et al. in 2013, where significantly fewer term infants in the early clamping group received phototherapy, even though clinical jaundice numbers was not statistically different. Lastly, Mercer et al. published a 2017 study comparing bilirubin levels in term infants between delayed clamping of 5 minutes versus immediate clamping with measurements of blood at 24 in 48 hours and found no significant difference in hyperbilirubinemia or symptomatic polycythemia. Please take note that institutions differ in the cutoff for treatment of jaundice, which may affect comparisons between papers. Regardless, due to this small increase in jaundice, ACOT recommends ensuring adequate resources to treat jaundice in institutions that will be practicing delayed cord clamping. So after looking at the data, it would seem that at least for the neonate, the benefits outweigh the risks. For mothers, I don't think there is enough data out there to say for sure. But if you are lucky enough to deliver in a setting where medications to control uterine acne and blood for transfusions is available, then there is probably no increase in maternal mortality to delay cord clamping. In places where women still die from postpartum hemorrhage, I think that the value proposition is probably a lot less clear. For developed areas of the world, though, the balance is shifting towards delayed cord clamping, with several colleges and institutes now recommending it. So let's take a minute and see what the different groups recommend. ACOL recommends delaying the clamping of the cord for at least 30 to 60 seconds in vigorous term in preterm infants, while the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommends waiting at least two minutes in healthy term in preterm infants. And the WHO recommends not clamping the cord any earlier than one minute in both term and preterm infants. All of them are careful to state that delayed cord clamping should never take precedence over any necessary neonatal resuscitation, and explicitly state that each case should be individualized and that the safety of delayed cord clamping should be assessed for each patient. Lastly, none of these agencies supports or recommends milking the umbilical cord because there is not enough data for either its benefits or risks. Now, putting out recommendations is one thing; getting people to follow them is another. With this new set of recommendations, time will tell whether actual practices will change. Going back to 1950, McCausland et al. surveyed members of the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology and found that up to two thirds of the members did not think cord clamping time was of any importance. And a survey from several different countries performed in 2009 found that only 53% practice delayed cord clamping, and 37% have never performed it. In some of the institutions that have tried to change protocols to emphasize delayed cord clamping, they have found it difficult to change the customary practice. Adoption of delayed cord clamping may or may not happen quickly, and there is still ongoing research in this area. But something to keep in mind is that all the governing bodies, including American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and WHO, now recommend it. So if it is not something that you currently utilize, you should think about what reasons you have for not doing it, and consider making a change. And even if you are not waiting to cut the cord right now, I hope that we can all at least turn away from citing sparing the bed linen as a reason to cut and clamp the cord quickly.
Thank you again, Dr. Kim, for a great episode. The theme that she highlighted regarding the push and pull between mother and baby permeates almost all of obstetrics, and I was fascinated about the roots of immediate cord clamping versus delayed cord clamping. You know, I think that too often of late, obstetric practices get demonized. Now, some of this is warranted, like in regards to unnecessary cesarean deliveries, and some of it is not, like I think we discovered here. Instead, some of these practices were started for good reasons, like preventing life-threatening hemorrhage, and have been going on for so long that they are almost baked into the DNA of our care. Now, our job, and I think Dr. Kim did a great job here, is to examine why we do the things we do, look at the evidence, and decide if these practices are still needed today. I think that most of us would agree that a maternal mortality due to hemorrhage is far worse than a slightly anemic baby. And so the hard part here is crunching that number needed to treat data. And now, unfortunately, we don't have enough data to come up with a concrete answer. And so it has to be case by case. And I think that Dr. Kim hit it on the head when she said that in places where we can control hemorrhage with other means, that delayed cord clamping and a less aggressive management of the placenta is probably appropriate. And in places that can't deal as well with those cases of hemorrhage, that maybe active management of the placenta is still needed. You know, after all, it was invented in the first place in an era without uterotonics or safe blood for transfusion. Now, we are going to continue this theme about push and pull between mom and baby in the next episode when we talk about GBS sepsis in newborns and the various prophylactic methods. But until then, I want to thank you all for listening. And please, get in that Slack, send me an email so I can get you invited, because I'm sure that we're going to have some great conversations about delayed core clamping right there in the next couple weeks. 